Hello, my name is David Friedland and I'm with Texas Instruments. Welcome back to the online SysBIOS training workshop. In this portion, we'll be introducing SysBIOS threads, including discussion of hardware interrupts, also known as HUIs, as well as the idle thread. A common way to implement an embedded system is with what's called a foreground background scheduling scheme. With this technique, there are two basic priority levels that software is executing at. When the system starts up, it performs some initialization, including setting up any peripheral devices and enabling interrupts. After initialization is complete, execution drops into a loop in which the lower priority background processing is done. When a peripheral device asserts an interrupt to our processor, an interrupt service routine is executed that buffers the data from the device and does any high priority processing that is needed, including setting flags to shape the processing of the background process. Since this ISR preempts the background processing, it means that it is running at a higher priority and is called the foreground process. This software architecture has been used extensively and quite successfully, but it does have some limitations. There is inherently only two major priority levels to assign processing at, so that may pose a major constraint for more sophisticated applications. This can potentially be worked around by disabling different levels of interrupts with the interrupt mask register within the ISR to allow other ISRs to preempt it. But this technique scales very poorly and is fraught with the risk of introducing unintended consequences. It also does not give the developer very fine-grained control of the background thread's execution. By introducing SysBIOS to the system, a developer gets access to a very rich set of system services, including services for threading. In this training module, we'll talk about the most fundamental parts of threading services, which will open the door for more sophisticated techniques that we describe in other training modules, such as software interrupts, tasks, semaphores, and events. It turns out that our application running on top of the SysBIOS scheduler will initially look quite similar to the foreground background implementation. When the application starts executing, it will perform some initialization very similar to what we had before, and then it will call the BIOS start function to actually start the SysBIOS scheduler. Once the BIOS scheduler starts, it will begin executing the highest priority thread that is ready to run. If there is no higher priority thread, then the idle loop, which always operates at the lowest priority, is the thread that runs. What the idle loop runs is totally up to the developer, who simply statically configures various functions to execute in an endless loop. Just because the idle loop executes at the lowest priority, doesn't mean that the functions run from there are unimportant. Typical uses for the idle loop include user interface code, built-in system test, and it's especially good for activating low power modes of the device or system, since it's assured at that point of not interfering with any fundamental processing. One note, the idle loop either needs to be invoked explicitly by the application calling the idle run API, or more commonly, by a task running at priority zero. For more information about this, you should view the online training module on tasking. We previously talked about interrupt processing being done in a generic interrupt service routine, but now instead of running plain interrupt service routines, SysBIOS applications run those threads from what is called a BIOS hardware interrupt, or a HUI. These HUIs will preempt the idle thread in the same way that a foreground process preempts a background process. At the core of the SysBIOS hardware interrupt is a piece of technology called the Interrupt Dispatcher. The dispatcher makes it possible for hardware interrupts to be run properly with other BIOS threads in the system, and also provides other benefits such as optimization and ease of use. When a HUI is created in a system, the location of the dispatcher is what is patched into the interrupt vector table, while the address of the interrupt service routine, the interrupt mask, and other HUI params information is stored in the dispatch table data structure. 
if any interrupts preempt one another, an interrupt stack is used to save the context. There are a number of benefits to using the interrupt dispatcher. Because the dispatcher is a piece of code common to all the interrupt handling, it can help reduce the code size footprint of our system. If we're using task threads, each with their own stack, then the fact that the dispatcher is using a separate stack for interrupts means that each of the task stacks can be smaller. One critical reason for using the interrupt dispatcher is that it is knowledgeable about the SysBIOS scheduler, so other lower priority threads will be properly disabled while the high priority interrupt service routines are executing. And if any threads, such as tasks or SWEs, are made ready to run by the ISR, and are a higher priority than the thread that the HUI preempted, then those higher priority threads will properly preempt the lower priority thread. In addition, the interrupt dispatcher allows the user to enable some instrumentation that will track when interrupts occur. Note that use of the dispatcher is not mandatory, particularly if no SysBIOS APIs are called from within the ISR. Although the dispatcher is implemented for you by SysBIOS, I think there is good value in seeing what actually goes on inside, so I'm going to spend a few minutes walking through the dispatcher execution. The first thing that the dispatcher does after it is vectored to is disable the task scheduler. The reason for this is that we don't want any tasks that are made ready to run to preempt the hardware interrupt processing, since HUIs by definition are treated as an implicitly higher priority thread. I should also mention that this call to task disable is optimized out of the dispatcher if the task module is not enabled, in order to make the execution of the dispatcher as efficient as possible. I mentioned before that one benefit of the dispatcher is that it maintains a separate stack for interrupt processing. So if the stack pointer is currently pointing to a task stack, this is the time it switches to the interrupt stack. The dispatcher also stores away the interrupt return pointer in case the user needs to retrieve it using the get IRP API call. This is another step that can be optimized out if there is no need to ever take that API call. Like the task scheduler, the SWE scheduler is also disabled so that any software interrupts that are made ready to run will be deferred. And similar to tasks, if the SWE module is disabled, then this call to SWE disable will be optimized out. Developers have the option of attaching hook functions to the HUI for instrumentation or other purposes, so the SWE hook begin function will now be called. If the auto nesting feature of the dispatcher is turned on, that is, if you need interrupts enabled during the execution of the HUI function so that it can be preempted by other interrupts, then the interrupt mask is applied and global interrupts are enabled at this point. Now the actual ISR function is executed and then if auto nesting is enabled then global interrupts are disabled again and the interrupt mask is restored. Another hook function is potentially called at this point if one was configured to run and then at this point, the SWE scheduler is run to allow execution of any higher priority software interrupts that are ready to run. If tasking is enabled, the stack pointer is now switched back from the interrupt stack to the task stack, and then the task scheduler is run. One final note. When developers are writing a generic ISR, they use the compiler interrupt keyword so that context is saved properly to the stack. However, when using a SysBIOS HUI, the dispatcher is already taking care of saving the thread context, so if the interrupt keyword is used in a HUI, it will cause a catastrophic runtime failure in the code. So don't do that. Here is a summary of the runtime API of the SysBIOS HUI module and how to create a HUI during runtime. If you look at the code snippet here, I've created three different variables. The first two are types defined by the Hui module itself, the first being a structure that holds all of the various Hui parameters. The second variable is used to store the handle of the Hui that we will create. By calling Hui params init, we can fill the param structure with all of the default parameter values. 
we can then easily update the parameters that we want with different values while not worrying about the others. We are also setting up an error block variable so that if the create failed, we could find out more information on why it failed. Finally, we call hui create, which will instantiate the hui instance and return back the handle to the new hui. Also on this slide is a summary of the other API calls used to control a hui. In this module, I tried to cover some of the basic and generic parts of using SysBIOS HUIs. However, much of the HUI implementation is actually dependent on the device family that you're working on. We're planning to add device-specific modules to this training series, so please check out whether there is one posted for the device family that you're using. If there is, you should be able to get more chip-specific information there about hardware interrupts. SysBIOS is included as a component to CoComposer Studio. However, if you'd like to download SysBIOS as a standalone product, you can go to the webpage listed here. If you have any questions about using SysBIOS, or if you'd like to make suggestions on how to improve this training series, please post a comment to the tie to e forum BIOS page at the web address shown here. There are some very knowledgeable developers and users of SysBIOS who might be able to help you out. Good luck with your upcoming software development.